Welcome back to Bombastic Nation and Ting and Ting and Ting. Back with some more vibe for you. Yes, I, you know what I mean? And I would like to thank everybody for watching the videos. You know what I mean? Thank you for watching it with me. Because we fam and ting, you know, so we're going to watch it and we're going to learn together. You know what I mean? The more we know about each other, the more we're going to like quite possibly respect each other. So, you know, come on, tell your friends, come here, let's learn some history, figure out where we were, why we were where we, we are, why we are where we are. I hope that could just make the place a better place to live in. You understand what I'm saying? Instead of the fighting and fussing and thing and all of that carrying on. So somebody suggested to me that I uh, reacted to this one here, you know, because uh, they thought I might find it interesting and uh, that other people might find it interesting. And this one is called The History of Punt, P-U-N-T, or is it Punt, uh, Somalia Tanajter, and ancient Egypt. Now, the Ta Nejter, I hope I pronounced that right, you know, hit me up in the comment section and let me know if I screwed it up because, you know, I probably did. But, you know, we're going to go ahead and watch this. No delay. Let's YouTube and Sib Sib check this vibe out here. Ah, we already getting into the nitty gritty of some ancient stuff. Ancient history of modern Muslim nations. The history of Punt. I'll get the Let's see if it's punt or punt. Recent archaeological developments have made it possible for modern academics to decipher the ancient inscriptions left behind by the Egyptians, giving Ooh. us a much clearer perspective into their lives, beliefs and societies. Yet despite the profound mystical appeal and the undeniable influence of ancient Egyptian civilization, the Egyptians themselves were equally intrigued and fascinated by the allure of the unknown, unexplored and unexplainable. Like I am. When Egyptian inscriptions became more accessible to Egyptologists following the discovery and decoding of the Rosetta Stone, researchers began to take note of the fact that the ancient Egyptians seemed to have been captivated by a sacred land, one to which they had made many references to in their native language as Denejder, or the land of Denejder. the gods. I almost had in it. In ancient descriptions of this magnificent land, paint a picture of a luxurious realm, rich in natural resources, from which all good things came into Egypt. To the ancient Egyptians, Denejder wow. was a haven an emporium of heavenly produce and exquisite commodities, which lends its name to fantastic tales and stories comparable to El Dorado or Atlantis. The Egyptians El paid Dorado. so much respect mm. and reverence to this land that they gave it many names, one of which was Poinet or Poine, which the ancient Greeks translated as Opone. Later on, the Romans called it Cape Aromatica and Regio Cinema Fore, the land of cinnamon. Yeah. However, the ancient Romans had mistakenly attributed the region with the cultivation and production of cinnamon, whereas it served only as a commercial hub and conduit for the trade and distribution of spices that were imported from the... I bet that happened a lot. You have to ask yourself, what really came from where? We know because of different climates, certain things can't grow in certain climates we totally understand that but there's so many tropical climates around the world you know because like for instance we had a thing with coffee and uh apparently the somalis were the bigger trades in coffee and coffee was discovered or it originated from ethiopia and i had a lot of people told me tell me that in the comment section so 
The question is, how do we know what originate from where? There's so many millions of years. What we could say is, the first known place that something come from is such and such. You know what I mean? Because even living in the Caribbean, a lot of the tropical stuff, uh, uh, agricultural stuff that's there, a lot of it was brought there. You know what I mean? It wasn't indigenous to that area. So how do we really know? You know, and then and and the Caribbean became synonymous with sugarcane. You know what I mean? And uh, did the sugarcane was it growing wild there? Was it brought there? I think it was brought there. I'm just you know questioning and thing. You know, putting questions in your head. The Indians and continents and transported elsewhere. In modern terms, the land of Poinet is most commonly identified as the land of Punt. Punt. And many studies I have been conducted right. to identify which modern region is the direct descendant of that ancient and magnificent land from which the ancient Egyptians drew so much of their inspiration and resources. However, the interest was certainly not one-sided. In fact, historical accounts detail evidence of more than one occasion in which an Egyptian pharaoh had hosted royal members and delegates from the land of Punt. There are also historical accounts of chiefs sending their children from Punt towards Egypt in order to attain an education in the Egyptian courts. Alongside other prominent citizens coming from nearby kingdoms and regions such as Kush and Iran. Ah, let's see what the people at Punt was like, or who they are. So what exactly did the ancient Egyptians find so captivating and interesting in Punt? According to their own accounts, we have some distinctive characteristics of the people and the land of Punt. For example, the villages of Punt have been described as containing honeycombed shaped houses that are held above the water by stilts, oh. and the land was said to have been governed by kings who acted upon the wise counsel and support of sagacious elders. Farahu, the only king of Punt to have been named and identified by the Egyptians, was described as having a long pointed beard which grew only on his chin. His attire consisted of a loincloth that was held together by a belt in which a dagger was firmly fixed. As for the inhabitants of Punt, they were characterized as having good qualities and attributes, with particular mention of their generosity, which was only matched by their courage and valor on the battlefield. This description corroborates what the ancient Egyptian scribes depicted in their records as they characterized the people of Punt as a tall people with a dark reddish complexion complemented by thin facial features and lank curly hair. However, by the 18th Egyptian dynasty, the natives of Punt were commonly depicted as having tightly cropped hair. In the 5th century BC, Greek historian Herodotus, known as the father of history in the Western tradition, refers to a race of people called the Microbians, who dwelt in a region south of Egypt. These people reportedly had an average lifespan of 120 years, wow. which was attributed to their diets, mainly comprised of milk and meat. Some historians have concluded that Herodotus's description of the microbians was in fact a direct reference to the people of Punt, I mean, whom he had characterized as having been... Isn't that, isn't that ironic? Because they said they lived to be 120 because their diet was meat and milk, and now people are saying milk is not that good for you. <laughs> so we did something to the milk for it to be not good for you. You know what I mean? I mean, they did have like, you know, mass trading and stuff going on. So, you know, they traded in milk and stuff like that. You know, they, they traveled, they had to export it. So how come nowadays... You hear some doctors say milk is not healthy and then back then they attribute their long life to milk and meat. And people even say, I don't really eat a whole lot of meat. I eat some meat, but I don't eat beef or pork or nothing like that. So does that is that going to shorten my life or all the stuff they put in the meats now is not good for you anyway? I don't know. Being some of the tallest and most handsome of people. 
I could understand the tall and handsome. <laughs> Seated strategically between two magnificent continents in close proximity to powerful civilizations, there is sufficient historical evidence to suggest that Punt was a commercial center for several goods that were traded across various parts of the world, including mainland Africa and throughout the Asian continent. The luxurious items that were reportedly transported in and out of Punt included gold, ebony, elephant tusks, wild animals, exotic animal skins, spices, cosmetics, plants and incense including the biblically celebrated gifts of frankincense and ah. Trade between Egypt and Punt So, so all that stuff come from beneficial. Africa there, huh? The inscriptions make it clear mm -hmm. that a fair and equitable exchange was transacted on either side. The Egyptians were able to extract resources from Punt in exchange for jewelry, tools, and weapons from Egypt. Punt had a special relationship with ancient... Nothing has changed, huh? Give me your resources, I'll give you guns. And uh, well, back then was, you know, swords and, and, and whatever the Egyptians used to fight. Give me your, 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 your resources and I'll give you stuff to kill each other. <laughs> Egypt, as the latter had sent Nothing various changed, expeditions towards Punt in as early as 2000, 480 BC. Wow. With much earlier historic records evidencing the fact that the ancient Egyptians had been trading with the people of Punt during the reign of King Khunum Khufu, who reigned during the fourth Egyptian dynasty between 2613 and 2498 BCE. He is historically credited with having commissioned the construction of the Great Pyramid of Giza a landmark that is now counted amongst the seven wonders of the ancient world. However, the oldest surviving record of a journey to Punt comes to us from the Palermo Stone, which dates back to the Old Kingdom during the Fifth Dynasty, when Egypt was ruled by King Sahore in around 2500 BC. The exact period in which this mutual exchange between Punt and Egypt truly began cannot be qualified conclusively. However, it is most prudent to say that the earliest known trade missions between Egypt and Punt can be dated somewhere between the 4th and the 5th dynastic rule. Yeah. Later, during the 11th dynastic rule, accounts of another fabulous Egyptian expedition to Punt were documented in two inscriptions found in Wadi Hamamat and subsequently attributed to the Egyptian noble Hanenu, who is also known as Hanu. His writings inform us of the mission undertaken during the reign of Mentuhotep III, who ruled Egypt approximately 2,000 years before the advent of Christ. The accounts reveal many details of the voyage, including the number of men, estimated to have been 3,000 in total. Mentuhotep III became the first Middle Kingdom ruler known to have sent an expedition to Punt, though such expeditions became more frequent during the 12th Egyptian dynasty. However, Later historic records indicate that trade relations between Egypt and Punt were temporarily suspended during the Second Intermediate Period, although the pattern would continue from 1478 BC under the reign of the legendary and much celebrated queen Hatshepsut, who reigned over Egypt during its 18th dynastic rule. According to legendary accounts... Man, there was a lot of queens and stuff back then, and but, but it seems like... There's not records of them a lot. I was reading some, somebody had uh, commented on another video I did, and they, they talked about the queens, you know. Uh, it was a video on Ethiopia, and uh, they were talking about uh, there were so many queens, and there was actually uh, a kingdom that had successive queens, and they were very successful, but there's very little record of them. Hmm. Else. The queen was inspired to undertake this fabulous expedition by an oracle of the ancient Egyptian god Amun Ra during the ninth year of her rule. She mobilized what was arguably the first large scale expedition to Punt during the reign of the Puntite king Parahu and his wife Queen Ati. Queen Hatshepsut's expeditionary force was comprised of five ships and the voyage to Punt lasted between 20 to 25 days. 
details of this epic journey to Punt remain carved into the walls and artifacts found in the temple of Queen Hatshepsut, which is situated in Deir al Bahri, near Luxor, in Egypt's famous Valley of the Kings. The writings and descriptions visible on the wall reveal clear illustrations of Punt's beautiful scenery and the beehive shaped houses, which were raised above the water by wooden stilts. There are also visible references to its palm trees and natural surroundings. In the surviving hieroglyphic engravings, we also read the following message. Sailing on the sea and making a good start for God's land. Making landfall safely at the terrain of Punt. The Egyptian expeditionary forces returned home with some of the most exotic imports, including trees, in particular 31 incense trees, Boswellia, from the land of Punt. This importation of foreign fauna which included plants and trees, was reportedly the very first time in recorded history wherein crops were successfully transported from one geographic region and cultivated in another. Wow. In fact, these plants survived in Egypt and flourished for many millennia. This is evidenced by the fact that the same type of trees can still be seen and found outside Queen Hatshepsut's complex in Deir al-Bahri. Oh, I'd like to Queen see that. Queen Hatshepsut's expedition to Punt was arguably one of the greatest and most documented journeys to Punt. The Egyptian trade relations A with woman the people of Punt was an ancient and tremendously powerful one, dating back to as early as the 4th or 5th dynasty. The commercial, cultural and spiritual exchange continued through to the end of the 19th Egyptian dynasty during the reign of Ramesses the Great, who ruled Egypt between 1279 to 1213 BCE and continued through to the earlier part of the 20th Egyptian dynasty, resulting in the loss of these expeditions known to historians, which was reportedly during the reign and rule of Ramesses III, who resided over Egypt in the 12th century BC. In an ancient papyrus record, Egyptian scribes describe how Ramesses III constructed great transport vessels loaded with limitless goods from Egypt, they reached the land of Punt, unaffected by misfortune, safe and respected. All right, now we're going into the religious stuff. Punt was a land of luxury, offering ivory, ebony and a gun. The Egyptians were also very fond of animal skins and leather which Punt exported in large varieties and in abundance, ranging from giraffe skin to the more exotic varieties including panther and cheetah skins. Leather was highly prized and very fashionable amongst Egyptian priests who also imported live animals for the purpose of entertainment and religious ceremonies. <laughs> Specimens included Cynocephalus baboons, which were considered sacred in Egypt. Punt's steady supply of luxury produce into Egypt's ancient temples had earned it a sanctified status with the priestly class who referred to the region as the personal garden of their god Amun Ra. The land of Punt was long associated with Egyptian deities due to the fact that many of the items used for their offerings and venerations originated from Punt. However, the two civilizations may have shared a more profound religious and spiritual connection based upon the belief that the gods of Egypt had an affinity and appreciation for the land of Punt. There is evidence that one of the most popular Egyptian deities, Bez, also known as the dwarf god, originated from Punt. Huh. See, even back then, even back then, the exchange in religious ideas, you know what I mean? kind of make you wonder man you know a lot of the religious ideas which is purely what it was meant to be because there's so much you know trading back and forth of ideas and and academic stuff and you know and even agricultural stuff yeah I, I, I'm gonna just pose questions <laughs> 
Although ancient Egyptian archives are replete with glorious tales making explicit references to the land of Punt, archaeologists and Egyptologists are yet to find a single proof that they can all agree upon as the definite and irrefutable proof of where Punt currently lies. The ancient Egyptians told us almost everything we need to know, except the most important detail, the, the location, location of Punt. Punt. Wow. It would seem as if the ancient Egyptians had a cruel sense of humor, or perhaps they had conspired to keep this consecrated land sanctified and enshrouded by a perennial mystery. As a matter of fact... Oh, they just wanted to keep it so they could keep doing the trade and getting all the exotic stuff so they, they, uh, we ain't gonna tell nobody because apparently they did it for centuries and centuries. Not even the glorious queen, Hatshepsut, reveals anything about the location of Punt, despite the very detailed and elaborate accounts of the magnificent trade envoys she had sent there. The inscriptions on the wall of her tomb tell us about the number of days, the number of vessels, laborers, distances traveled, types of plants, quality of produce, and many other intricate minutia, but fails to make any mention about the geographic location oh. of their magnificent destination. To this very day, modern scholars and researchers are filtering through thousands of years worth of Egyptian artifacts and inscriptions in search of a clear indication for the location of Punt. Yet since the mid-19th century, not one of these scholarly endeavors has resulted in a conclusive answer to this ancient riddle. For over 150 years, the higher ranks of academia have scoured through maps, scribbling and circling over many modern nations that may potentially be the true location of ancient Punt. A multitude of elaborate theories have since been advanced favoring a colorful collection of potential locations ranging from places such as Syria, Sinai, Yemen, Eastern Sudan, Northern Ethiopia, Somalia, Kenya, and even Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka? Though the land of Punt has now become a semi-mythical place, somewhat comparable to Atlantis in European terms, to the ancient Egyptians, it was indeed a very real place from the earliest dynasties through to the New Kingdom. Interestingly, the exact reasons as to why the legacy of Punt gradually faded out of reality and was subsequently reintroduced to the realms and confines of legend and mythology is not known to us. Oh. However, following the reign of Ramesses III, Punt gradually became more and more obscure in the texts and records of Egyptian chroniclers until it was eventually resigned to legendary tales of mythological status. I wonder how many places. How many places became that? You know what I mean? I know you could find out stuff by, you know, doing archaeological digs and stuff like that, but you know, even that is kind of limited because if the earth is as old as it is, stuff gets buried on the layers and layers of soil and sediment and all of that you know what i mean i mean like some of the mud we're walking on uh, unless of course it's in a volcanic area or an area that's usually you know eroded by mother nature on a regular basis like mass erosion and stuff how do we know how do we know wh who was actually on this ground here even before the native americans were here you know what i mean because somebody had to be here it just it was just wasn't just sitting here you know what i'm saying and things somebody had to travel and come around and stuff and uh it's only later in life i start hearing about the vikings were here long before columbus you know and this group was there long before columbus we know the native americans traveled a lot because they traveled down through the islands you know what i mean so that's proof that they were traveling and they came from somewhere else you know what i'm saying they weren't just here unless the big bang theory happened and just drop people all over the globe in raindrops but then again we were once one big uh plangia is what they call it i believe one big landmass wow that, that's just an expansive thing that you you know you just can't comprehend those things have changed and it's still changing you understand what i mean like i like always saying those things there's so much migration going on now that 
in like 50 to 100 years, we don't know what this world is going to look like. You know what I mean? Uh, will we have people still fighting to keep their race alive? You know what I mean? Or are we going to be just fighting to keep the human race alive? Period. But anyway, you know what I mean? Thank you all for tuning in with and watching this with me and thing. I hope you guys enjoyed this one. This was really interesting. You know what I mean? The fact that there's this place called Pont and there's written record of it, but there's no absolute geographical pinpoint of where the place is. Uh, but we know uh, it's somewhere in Africa. So there was the punt was like a superpower in its time, but a superpower of trade, it seems, because there is no, I haven't seen any thought of war. I'm going to look into this some more. I want to see. But then if nobody knows where it is, did somebody else write about it besides the Egyptians? Wow, the mystery, the mystery. But anyway, man, thank you guys for tuning in. Keep watching. Keep watching. I'm going to put a link in the description for this video so you can go check it out without me stopping and, and, uh, and, and uh, talking. Also, check out what else they have on that channel. You understand what I'm saying? If you're into history and stuff like that, I'm going to... I got to look for some more stuff on Punt because uh, now I'm intrigued. <laughs> Thanks for uh, tuning in with me and thing. Take care of yourselves, man, and cool runnings, all right?